Number 10, Secret Agent Matt. What if Daredevil never became Daredevil at all, but instead Matt Murdock became an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D.? That's the story told in this what if issue we get from volume 1 of the series in issue 28. Here we get to see an alternate reality where Daredevil never even became Daredevil. Tony Stark happened to be the one responsible for the accident that blinded young Matt as it was his truck filled with toxic chemicals that was driving through the city when Matt had his fateful accident. When he learned of what happened, he decided to turn over Matt to S.H.I.E.L.D hoping that they could help him. Nick Fury saw great potential in Matt Murdock and trained him to become a secret agent for S.H.I.E.L.D. Matt goes on a mission to rescue his dad, who is kidnapped by Hydra, and in the end, joins up with the S.H.I.E.L.D. team. Number 9. House of M Although Daredevil wasn't one of the main players in the House of M storyline, an alternate reality created by Scarlet Witch, he still existed in this reality. Here Matt Murdock was still a lawyer and was even lucky enough to tangle with She-Hulk. Despite the fact that he and She-Hulk are both lawyers, they don't really team up a lot in the main continuity, nor are they a couple. But in House of M issue number 3, we learn of a rumor floating around the Jade Giantess She-Hulk that she has the hots for Matt and that both lawyers have been seen canoodling in and around the courthouse. What a scandal. And friends, before I move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more good, good, good Top 10 Nerd content, you need to check out our newest channel, Top 10 Nerd Elite. Go on over there, hit that subscribe, go to a video and type a little comment and be like, hey Amanda, I'm here, I did it. Number 8, Dare the Terminator. Dare the Terminator comes to us from the Amalgam Universe and is a combined version of both Marvel's Daredevil and DC's Deathstroke the Terminator. A strange but cool fact about Dare is that she's a woman, despite the fact that both the characters that were amalgamated together to create her in this universe are male. Dare, however, also received her name from the fact that she is a fearless daredevil who few dare to challenge. She had horns surgically grafted onto her head by enemy the big question, aka Enigma Fisk, and she is also missing an eye. Kind of got like of course, she's an Amalgam character, so she's got a little bit of both things going on there. Number 7, Daredevil 2099. This alternate version of Matt Murdock's character comes to us from one of the 2099 universes. Sam Fisk in the future is the heir to the Kingpin legacy, but finds himself struggling with guilt surrounding that legacy. To counterbalance all the bad his grandfather has wrought, Samuel Fisk decides to become the new Daredevil in the future, becoming our Daredevil 2099 over 2992. Kind of weird to think that in the great Marvel multiverse, there is a reality where it is Wilson Fisk's ancestor and not Matt's that becomes the new New Daredevil. But this weird fact is also what makes Samuel Fisk so interesting as DD as well. Number 6, Velasco. On Earth X, there are actually a few different versions of Daredevil. Most people probably think of the actual character who appears severely depressed and to kind of crave his own death, who goes by the name Daredevil, but there are actually a few others besides. One version is also an alternate of Nightcrawler, Kurt Wagner. This alternate version of the character ends up becoming Velasco, but later settles down in Hell's Kitchen choosing to operate as a hero for a time and protecting that neighborhood. So he's literally a red devil of a demon man running around Hell's Kitchen acting as its guardian. A pretty cool Earth 9997 visual reference or alternate to Earth 616's DD. Number 5. Exiles. The alternate Daredevil of Earth 181 is a version we see in the Exiles. Any reality where Daredevil serves the kingpin to me is weird, which is why this version makes our cut. After serving on the Weapon X team at the behest of the Time Breakers, this version was held captive in a crystal palace instead of being sent home as promised. However, when he did return home, we learned that Daredevil on Earth 181 is a brutalizer who works for the kingpin and seems to genuinely enjoy violently attacking his targets. Number 4, 1602. The 1602 version of Matt Murdock is kind of weird in the sense that he became blind and received his powers from venturing into a cave and eating green glowing goop that he found there. The whole point of this version of the story is to show how fearless of a character Matt was, but still, it's pretty weird even given how fearless he was that he'd ingest mysterious glowing green goo. That sounds like it could be slightly crossing the line from fearless to just plain stupid territory. Of course, sometimes those two traits do go hand in hand, so 
fair I guess. Needless to say it all worked out in the end as that is where 1602's Matthew Murdoch, also known as Sir Devil or the Bard, got his powers from. Oh yes, instead of living in his civilian life as a lawyer, Matthew here poses as a blind balladeer, a singer, but in secret operates as an expensive adventurer for hire or a bodyguard. Number 3 Kingpin Never mind a reality where Daredevil works for Kingpin, how about a reality where Matt Murdock never becomes Daredevil and instead becomes a deadly assassin working for the hand who eventually rises in their ranks and seeking more power works for Kingpin, eventually taking the title for himself as he builds his own crime syndicate. That is exactly what happens on Earth 65, where Matt Murdock is more criminal than anything. He started out down the path of a hero, but after Stick, who took him under his wing, was killed, he fell into the hands, or hand really, of the hand. This set him down a dark path towards villainy as he became more and more obsessed with power. Power. Number 2 Earth 666 On Earth 666, Daredevil is a literal devil who dares to join the other undead heroes to assemble as the Avengers of the Undead. We don't know much about this alternate version as he's only made an appearance in a few issues, but we can assume his abilities are similar to his 616 counterpart, with one of the major differences from 616 DD being that he actually appears to be a real red devil with giant horns coming out of his head. You can catch this alternate version of the hero in the 2010 Secret Avengers series in issues 33 to 36. Number 1, Deer Devil. He's a deer devil. Deer Devil was only briefly mentioned by Peter Porker and hails from his reality of Earth 25. What's so strange about this alternate version of Matt? You guessed it, he's a deer, hence the name Deer Devil. Deer Devil's civilian name here is actually also different from the 616 counterpart, and it is Bat Burdock. And he made his first appearance in the Spider Ham 25th anniversary special from June of 2010. Deer Devil was one of the heroes who Peter Porker got to know along the way as he transitioned from just being a regular young pig to the hero Spider Ham. As Peter Porker reminisces on his past, we see Deer Devil's head among the other characters that Spider Ham has encountered within his past. Which alternate versions of Daredevil do you think are the weirdest and why? What alternate versions of the character do you think would be super cool to see? Or to see more of if you know them already? Let us know in the comments below. Number 10, Dogpool. We'll start off on a cute note rather. Wade Wilson of Earth 103173, aka Dogpool, made his first appearance in Prelude to Deadpool Core, issue 3. Wilson was a dog being used as a test subject for Mascara X. Now, I love this version because it brings to light the animal testing for beauty products that happens, Mascara X taking place of the evil Weapon X in the story. So, after the test went south, they thought the dog didn't survive. His body turned all corpse like, it wasn't breathing, horrible, horrible stuff so they got rid of it. But those healing abilities brought him back to life. He then broke out of the garbage bag and started walking around again. I thought cats were the only ones with nine lives. What a sight to see. Now these circus performers did see this. They were driving by and just happened to see this dead dog come back to life, so they used it to make some moolah. He became the main act of their circus, appropriately named the Death Defying Hound. He was a circus performer until Wade Wilson, the main continuity Deadpool, showed up and then recruited him for the Deadpool Corps. The good boy met his fate in issue one of Deadpool Kills Deadpool, but he did so saving Wade, so it's a happier kind of note. Not really, but we'll say it is. Number nine, war. Earth 16558, our Deadpool gets an extreme makeover, superpowers edition. He shows up in Extraordinary X Men issue 8, and we only get to enjoy his presence for five issues. After Apocalypse returns in the early 21st century, he recruits Deadpool as one of his four horsemen. He recruits him for war. Deadpool and the other horsemen attacked Colossus, got him on the God Squad, and then together the evil team tracked down Storm and their young X Men. In Extraordinary X Men issue 10, the X Men were actually defeated and the Ark, containing 600 mutant embryos, were taken back to Apocalypse. Things weren't looking that great with Wade on the bad side. When the X-Men invaded Apocalypse's kingdom to try and save the day, Deadpool fought back and went at it with Iceman. Now Deadpool's mask gets ripped here, and then that's when you see Wade with his mouth sewn shut. Not again. We don't like seeing his mouth sewn shut. It's the opposite of what we want. Deadpool cuts his mouth open, and you think he's going to be like, help me, I don't know what I'm doing. But he actually just releases a swarm of insects all over Iceman, winning 
winning that battle in a gross, itchy way. But don't worry, Deadpool gets bugged himself later on. He'll soon know what that feels like. I'll explain more of that later on in this list. And before we continue on with this list, if you wanna go ahead and give us a thumbs up on this video, that would be awesome. Those likes add up and they really do support us and the company. You guys are the best, thank you so much. Let's get right back to this Deadpool list. Number eight, Deadpool the Duck. Howard the Duck has been seen in both Guardians movies and he was in Avengers Endgame. We see him gearing up alongside Earth's Mightiest. This dude has been in the same amount of MCU projects as Natalie Portman. Well, actually more, really, if you consider the main continuity. That's pretty insane, he's an important character. So when Deadpool the Duck came out back in 2017, fans were excited to see more of Howard. Howard's driving alone one night when Rocket crash lands into his car. Now he's about to congratulate Rocket on his recent box office success in Guardians, but he's rudely interrupted when the raccoon's eyes light up red and then he leaps at Howard. We got a classic case of space rabies. Some spazies. Some of them don't work. Luckily, this is Deadpool's story, so he comes in at just the right moment, and that's when him and Rocket start battling it out. Howard's trying to smooth things out while this is happening. He knows something's clearly off with Rocket. He's taking cover, he's just trying to stay out of the way. And then Deadpool shows back up in the middle of nowhere, questioning why he doesn't teleport more often, which is a great question. And then when he tries using it again, everybody gets fused together during this teleportation. Well, almost everybody. Number seven, Watari. First appearing in Five Ronin issue one back in 2011, Watari is a completely different version of Wade. He's the Deadpool of Earth 11542, referred to in this universe simply as the Fool. The story takes place in 17th century Japan. Watari was one of the best and most dangerous samurai of that time. But like Deadpool of other universes, he was done dirty. He was betrayed by his own friends. He was ambushed by his allies, and then he was just left for death. He laid low for a bit, not by choice. I mean, his face was scarred up. He now had an alcohol problem. He hit rock bottom, but eventually he found his footing and got that long awaited revenge. We see Watari the Fool make an appearance in Deadpool Kills Deadpool issue four, alongside some other wacky versions, which we can get into later on. Number six, Dreadpool. In the reality of Earth 12101, the X-Men brought Wade to Dr. Den Brighton, AKA Psycho Man, in an attempt to cure him. They wanted him to shut down the voices in Wade's head so he can be, you know, a normal civilian, but he didn't do that, did he? He actually did the opposite. Wade was now encouraged by all these voices in his head to kill the Marvel Universe. All those people, all those superheroes you love about to meet their fate in a horrible way. He started off by going after the Fantastic Four. Reed and the Thing were gone in just a few pages, and then Sue Storm held Dreadpool off for a bit by making his head explode, which usually does a trick for most villains, but it's Deadpool, so once he healed, she was next to go. Like the whole Fantastic Four family's gone in like literally three pages, it's so sad. Dreadpool then steals a device from Reed that he used to take down the Watcher. Even the Watcher isn't safe in this story, and neither are you. Check it out. Number five, Evil Deadpool. Now these names may start sounding a little bit confusing, like Dreadpool is an evil version that kills our heroes, and Evil Deadpool is the result of a collector with a gross hobby. That's right, Evil Deadpool is from the main 616 universe. He came to life in Deadpool Volume 4, Issue 44. Now it all started with this young gal named Elda Whitby. She was a psychiatrist who was obsessed with Wade. She was so obsessed that she would keep body parts that he lost over time. He'd battle it out, lose an arm, she'd go in, you know, carry it like Saving Private Ryan back to her house. Some of us had a rock collection, others collect kneecaps. That's fine, we're all different. So she would keep these parts in her freezer like a maniac right next to the jumbo freezies. And then when Deadpool found out about this horrible cold care package, he threw them all in a dumpster. This was actually the worst thing that Wade could have done, believe it or not, because once those body parts thawed out, they fused and grew back together to make this evil, much worse smelling Deadpool. Number four, Headpool. Wade Wilson of Earth 2149 first appeared in Marvel Zombies issue three. The Merc with half a mouth was among the population that gets infected in Marvel Zombie Run, but then when he's transported to the main 616 universe, he gets taken by armor, and that's when things start to get a little crazy for this guy. He ends up in Savage Land, and believe it or not, the other version that helps main 616 Deadpool assemble the core that I've been mentioning this entire list was this version. The guy with no body, just a head, is actually the perfect sidekick. Minus the non-stop talking, of course. 
Number three, Deadpool Kid. The Wild Wild Wade. Okay, an instant classic. Deadpool of Earth 1108 made his first appearance in Deadpool Merc with a Mouth, issue seven. When we meet him, he's wanted for bank robbery, arson, putting together a literal stampede, all that Wade goodness. It doesn't matter what timeline you catch him in, shenanigans are in order, clearly. This Deadpool would constantly talk about how much he wanted to take over the town. He had his sights set on Sheriff Fury and of course, bounty hunter Logan. This version's quite interesting, but like, let's be honest, a little limiting what you can do in these dusty towns. So after a 616 Wade shot him in the head and left him for dead, it wasn't until Deadpool kills Deadpool that we see this cowboy again. There's not much you can do in the wild, wild west. I mean, seeing Wade on a horse or, you know, shooting up saloons, it's cool, but limiting. Number two, Wolverine Pool. First appearing in Cable and Deadpool issue 46, this Wade Wilson still gets the superhero upgrade, but when Weapon X decides to give him the adamantium treatment, things play out a little bit differently. See, later on, he's recruited by Dreadpool, that guy I mentioned, to take on the Deadpool core members, so he's evil. He was doing a pretty good job, that adamantium skeleton was coming in handy, but during a fight, our main 616 Deadpool tossed a grenade full of bugs at Wolverine Pool. Remember I said you got some with bugs earlier? This is, this is payback, this is, uh, this is why you don't play with with bugs. So that bug grenade went off and the bugs ended up chewing way apart and all that was left literally was just that adamantium skeleton and claws. It's a pretty creative way to go out but it's also like really gross. It's kind of like if Oogie Boogie from Nightmare Before Christmas were to take you out or if that movie was rated R. It would look kind of something like this. And finally number one. Death Mask. On Earth 11683, Reed Richards was able to remove that lethal brain tumor from Wade's head, which opened an entirely new future for Wade. Now, he was better than ever. There were no evil voices swirling around in his head. In fact, the only voice in his head was his own bright ideas. This Wade was, in fact, a genius. This keeps getting more and more positive. That's great. We love happy endings. Nice number one smooth landing. Did he solve world hunger? Did he stop floods? Did he cure diseases? No, actually. He was still a criminal. A master criminal, actually. See, with that that brain, he ended up building an empire and went by the name Death Mask. So it was actually almost worse in this scenario. Just looking at his outfit, it's pretty obvious whose spot he's taking in this universe. He killed Victor Von Doom and changed a few colors to his evil getup, resulting in Death Mask, this red version of Doctor Doom. Even after Death Mask was beaten by our main Deadpool, it still didn't end. Death Mask then made a deal with Mephisto in order to release these horrible monsters on Earth and survive. One of those monsters was the Infernal Hulk. So he's full of brilliant ideas, they're just also evil. Kicking off the list at number 10, Anthony the Vampire. Making his first appearance in Ultimate Avengers issue 14, Anthony was the greatest vampire hunter who ever walked this earth. He trained Daredevil, Blade, and Edward Cullen. Okay, the last one I lied about, but still, you get it. When he meets up with Blade later on, he has a new look. He was eventually bitten by a vampire, so he became their leader as well. The coolest part about Anthony is that he uses a Mark I Iron Man suit to get around during the day, so the sun doesn't, you know, evaporate him or whatever. He captured and turned Smart Hulk into a bloodsucker, but his armor was stolen and used by Stick to fight back. Another Tony, another suit. Imagine you're in trouble and this guy rolls up on you. What a surprise that would be. Issue 16 of Ultimate Avengers opens with a great Twilight parody, but this is also the last time we see this Iron Man take flight. And that's because Hulk punched his head off, and usually when he does that, you don't come back. Vampire or not. Number nine, Iron Lantern. From the Amalgam Comic Universe, Iron Lantern is of course a millionaire who is in charge of Stark Aircraft. While he's working on a flight simulator, it straight up took off and flew him somewhere else. Best simulator ever, if I do say so myself. Then he crash landed on the ground, injuring Stark, and he realized he was brought to a crashed alien spaceship. That spaceship belonged to none other than Roman Sir, who died before getting a chance to talk to Hal Stark. Not being in the best condition, obviously, after the rocky landing, Hal started working with his newfound tech on a new suit hopefully to save his life. The Green Lantern upgrade of a suit saved his life for sure, but it also gave him the power to create anything out of green energy. He used a battery that reminded him of a lantern to do so. And then he went on to fight the aliens that had shot down Roman Sir and continued fighting enemies such as Madame Sapphire and Mandronesto, who yes, you already know exactly what I'm talking about. Before we continue on with this list, if you want to go ahead and give us a thumbs up, that would be great. It really helps us out here quite a bit. You're the best. Thank you so much for watching. Let's get right back into this list of weird Iron Mans. 
Number eight, Lord Iron. Coming from Marvel 1602, Lord Iron was amongst the other heroes who rose to fame, but a little bit back in time. See, Captain America was literally shot back in time, so the age of heroes has to begin there. And in turn, we get some fun versions of our Avengers. Anthony Stark was taken and held captive in the Holy Land during the English and Spanish War. A little different than the cave that he ended up with in our time. He was forced to make weapons still for them for weeks, mirroring Tony's origin in a fun, older way. David Banner was torturing him this time around, though, so Anthony makes his own suit powered by lightning bottles, okay? Now, it doesn't matter which timeline Tony ends up in, he's destined to be Iron Man one way or another. Number seven, Iron Man Noir. Coming from the Noir series, Iron Man of Earth 90214 had to go all the way to Atlantis to fix his heart problem. What am I talking about? Let's find out. Tony in this reality was an industrialist adventurer. It feels like national treasure almost. We meet Tony and the crew and they're looking for something called the Jade Mask. This mask that was said to cure any kind of ailment, so he figured, hey, it's worth a shot to fix the old ticker. It didn't work, so some traitors then revealed themselves once the mask was found, so Tony and Rhodey escaped and returned to New York. He goes on yet another treasure hunt with Rhodey, this time to Atlantis, because he heard a rumor that this power source could also do wonders to his heart, maybe, perhaps. Tony gets the trident, and again, he gets betrayed. Zemo and his forces were strong enough to kidnap Pepper, and Tony and Rhodes need a new plan. They travel to Zemo's castle, and it's then that it's revealed that Zemo is actually Tony's father, brainwashed by Strucker. And he was also equipped with Iron Man's suits because action and adventure. As far as noir storylines go, Iron Man isn't my favorite, but the whole Nathan Drake vibe that Tony has is still quite fun. And also, Atlantis. It's kind of weird. Dive in. Number six, Earth X. Also known as Earth 9997, this version of Iron Man hit the pages back in Earth X issue zero. This time around, the human race is at risk due to the release of Terrigen Mists. So Tony decides, you know what, I'm just gonna isolate myself, not being sure how the mist would react, which is a fair point. So in turn, he would wear his armor all the time, and then eventually he made an Iron Manor in New York. Super cautious, you know, with today's stuff going on, you can't really blame him. He went even further when he decided it was best to create his own team, the Iron Avengers. I was super paranoid. So eventually Galactus did come along, so Tony used his Iron Manor and distracted the Celestials beforehand. Now during this, Tony lost his life. Some wreckage impaled him, and for the first time in a while, Tony was able to breathe open air. How, you ask? Well, he died, and his soul immediately went to the realm of the dead, and that's when Captain Marvel's soul recruited him for an army set to take on death. Which is, first of all, nuts, because even after you die in Marvel Comics, you can't just chill out in heaven. You have to like go fight another war immediately. Like, come on. But death did eventually die, and that's when Tony got another huge upgrade in Paradise. Using the High Evolutionary's devices, Tony was changed into this angelic being, of course, still with wings. And he looked like Iron Man, so that's fun. You can customize your own angel outfit once you get up there. That's good to know. Number five. Tony Doom. Since What If is currently dropping weekly episodes on Disney+, Plus, we have to mention one of the more wild issues. What if Tony Stark had become Doctor Doom? It would probably be pretty bad. Yeah, yes, it is. So here in the storyline that both of them go to the same college instead of Reed Richards being Victor's roommate. So now it's Tony. Two geniuses in one dorm. Sounds like they would make dreams come true, but in reality, it was a living nightmare waiting to happen. Doom tricked Tony into switching bodies Freaky Friday style. And on top of that, Tony's memories were also wiped. So Tony in Doom's body gets in heat for the experiment and in turn, he gets sent back to Liberia. Meanwhile, Doom is in line to take over Stark Industries. He still is Tony Stark, so down the road, Doom Industries was now a competitor to Stark Industries. He's brilliant in any way. The pair end up creating their own armors. Of course, Tony builds a red and gold Doom armor while Doom makes a green and gray Iron Man armor. I'll give you a second to absorb that. There we go. It's a fun little swap with good action, but it's a little bit too confusing of a Freaky Friday type plot. But it's worth a shot. Go give it a try. Number four, Dead Man Walking. We look now over to Fantastic Four The End, released in 2007. Most of Tony's story here was the same, but during the Mutant Wars, Tony lost his life. Now, he didn't get redirected to a paradise where he would then become an Iron Man themed angel. Instead, he uploaded his subconsciousness into an AI. So now he lives through his armors, just swapping back and forth, walking around, which sounds like a solution, I guess, but living forever? Come on, Tony, I don't think that's a way to go, really. Number three, Steel Corpse. Tony and his suit have always been so close. It's had its back many times, sometimes even acting for itself and making a judgment call. Like in Iron Man 3, it literally woke Tony up from a nightmare aggressively. We love that future tech. But in the Age of X storyline, the suit literally has his back as Tony and the suit begin to merge. Ooh, I'm itchy just reading this. This started right after a virus began taking its toll on Tony. He was rapidly declining health-wise, so he chose a more fitting name, Steel Corpse, to be kind of funny, but also he looks like a corpse. 
corpse. So he's like, nah, I'm just gonna admit it. He, alongside other much healthier Avengers, were tasked to take down mutants. But when the gang got there, they of course opted to save them instead. Superhero twist of logic, we love it. Only Tony's advanced suit wasn't exactly on board with his new plan, and it started to act out by itself. It still wanted to save the day, although this was not the right way to do it. Captain America had no choice but to end the life of Steel Corpse in order to save the mutants. Number two, Iron Goblin. Making his first appearance in the Spider Island series, Iron Goblin wasn't made through any reality warping or anything like that. Instead, this happens during the resistance assault on Spider Queen, which is sounding crazier than what I just said. Tony Stark ends up getting captured and infected with the spider virus. He's going nuts at this point, so the rest of the heroes try and snap him out of it by using Goblin Formula, which is a solution, I guess, I don't know, read a book, read a comic book, Avengers. It's gonna, something bad's gonna happen. So he went from being a spider monster to Iron Goblin. Pretty crazy 24 hours for Tony. Tony was still Tony after this point though, despite the evil green look on his face. Like he even said Norman stole his armor before, so he was just evening it out. Haha, <laughs> he's funny, he's still Tony, nice. But as time went by, every minute that passed, that formula started to in fact change Tony. Like for example, he was flying around on the glider, although he can fly with his suit. It's not looking good. He knew he was going insane, so he sacrificed himself when the Queen's army attacked. Still a hero nonetheless, although he's mean and green and throwing pumpkin bombs. And finally, number one, Iron Hammer. Coming from Warp World, Iron Hammer, aka Stark Odinson, first came to life in issue three of Infinity Wars. So when Gamora had the Infinity Stones, she trapped everybody's soul in the Soul Gem, and then folded the universe in half, which resulted in all of our heroes merging together. Pretty fun. So rightfully referred to as Warp World, we soon get to meet Soldier Supreme, Ghost Panther, Weapon Hex, and Iron Hammer. Stark Odinson in this pocket universe is the son, of course, of Howard Odin, chieftain of Asgard. He has the Iron Hammer armor, and of course he has a massive literal hammer of the gods to get the message across. Being a combination of both, he can face powerful villains like Stain Odinson, who is a blend of Loki and Obadiah Stain, and even Madame Hell. One of the coolest looking versions, definitely, and also one of the more powerful. A great note to end on. Kicking off the list at number 10, Spider's Man. We'll kick off this list on an itchy note. This version of Spider-Man from Earth 11580 is actually Spider's Man. You might be asking, wait a minute, Taylor, spiders, like more than one? Oh yeah, he's actually made up of thousands of spiders that work together as if they're one person, like a hive mind. Huh. See, before that incident, that horrible incident, Peter and Gwen were visiting Horizon Labs, and instead of one spider taking a bite out of Peter's finger and then blessing him with biceps and perfect vision, he instead fell into a pit of radioactive spiders where they all consumed him, and subsequently his consciousness was spread out through all of those spiders. Hive mind, so gross. How horrible is this already? If I just got robbed and Spider's Man came to save the day, I'd be sick. Just seeing a cover of this guy on spider Geddon issue three makes me so uncomfortable. I mean, hats off to Christos Gage and George Molina for making this character one of the most unique versions. You can definitely say that, definitely unique. The Spider. Coming from Earth 15, The Spider, also known as Inmate 24739, uh-oh, made his first appearance in Exiles issue 12. Inmate, what's going on with that? Is Peter bad in this reality? Yeah, he's actually pretty horrible. He's a redhead who has a lot in common with Cletus Cassidy, and in turn, he gets slapped with 67 consecutive life sentences by a jury. He's not as into the saving lives thing, he's rather into the opposite. He joined Weapon X after being drafted by the Time Breakers. Now, as horrible as the spider sounds, he still feels like Peter when you read this comic. He has a similar sense of humor as Deadpool here, so it's still fun, although he's evil. Hyperion of Earth 4023 also joined, became the leader, and the spider stood by his side as they planned on conquering multiple realities. Pete met his fate in issue 44 of Exiles when Firestar hit him with a mega blast. He turned into ash. Already cremated, look at that, we get to save money. And before we continue on with this list, if you wanna go ahead and give us a thumbs up, that would be awesome. It really does help our nerd squad over here and our nerd base. You guys are the best, thanks for sticking around. Let's keep going with this list. Number eight, Spider Kid. Making his first appearance in Spider Force issue one, Earth 218 Peter's childhood is actually darker this time around, believe it or not. See, both of his parents passed away in a car crash, and Uncle Ben was a mean old man afterwards who was just horrible to Peter all the time. Peter actually changed his name to Charlie, and then he didn't try and be good. He actually became quite a troubled young man. He had to spend two years at the Administration for Child Services, and then two more years at the Horizon Juvenile Detention Center. In order to get by, he chose to steal money from street dealers. He's not a bad kid, although I've just said that he is a few times. He just had a horrible childhood, and he slipped down the wrong path. It happens. 
But that all changed when Charlie was recruited into the Superior Spider Army by Ashley Barton. She calls him Grandpa because he reminds her of an older Pete from her reality. He's like, yeah, I'm 13 though, please don't call me Gramps. Awesome. Coming to you live from Warp World, one of the most out there versions of Peter Parker, hit the page in Infinity Wars issue 3. Moon Knight and Spider-Man are gearing up, they're making a game plan to take down Gamora. And Spider-Man says, look, just punch whoever I punch in a second. Deal? Easy peasy. That turns out to be a lot harder than imagined when the both of them merge together. Alongside Arachnite, we got to meet some other amalgams of characters. We got Ghost Panther, Soldier Supreme, Iron Hammer, and more. So much more. Peter's mind was also separated into four different personalities, each desiring dominance. So we have Science Pete, the Knight Pete, Friendly Neighborhood Arachnid Pete, and for when it comes to signing checks and shaking hands, we have CEO Pete. Number six, Astro Spider. Jumping on over to Earth 3145, making his first appearance in Spider Force Issue 2, John Jameson III was an astronaut for NASA, and during one mission, a spider got trapped in his suit, which that's absolute nightmare scenario right there. But when the space shuttle was hit by cosmic waves, John then obtained these amazing new abilities. He didn't come home and stop bank robbers one quip and whip at a time. See, this Earth was now destroyed by a thermonuclear war, so Jameson was assigned to oversee the construction of a spacecraft on the Nautilus platform. He, along with 35 others, are the last of humanity. After this cosmic mishap, John can now read minds. He can create webs of solid telekinetic energy, but he met his fate a few issues later when he was feasted on by Verna. Sometimes being a spider totem sucks. Number five, the savage Spider-Man. Spider-Man, but a savage, so savage. This Peter Parker entered comics in Vault of Spiders issue one. When a plane went down over Antarctica, Peter was the only survivor out of his family. He didn't have powers yet, he didn't swing his way to freedom, but he survived by using the last parachute. During his rough emergency landing, the wind moved him around quite a bit, and unfortunately he landed in one of the worst places on the planet, a spider's nest in Savage Land. Ugh, I was just done with the spider stuff, now we're back to being itchy again. They all just bit him over and over and over again, and powers of course soon followed. The Savage Spider-Man was the new protector of Savage Land. Later on, he was recruited into the Spider Army by Ghost Spider to fight off the Inheritors back on our Earth 616. Honestly, this is a great version. I love when Wilson Fisk sees the boy growing up again. See, he was the reason the plane went down in the first place those many years ago. So when he returns to see if this savage Spider-Man is real, he gets a little payback. Number four, Hostess Cake Spider-Man. I think it's time we talk about one of the weirdest but yummiest versions of Spider-Man. Not only is Peter dishing out quips and flips, but he's also feeding the world too. What a hero. This version was born in an ad for Hostess Twinkies, so naturally its own Marvel Universe has to exist. And also, it's fun to make it exist and to think about it. When it came down to taking on villains, Spider-Man wouldn't web them up, instead he would just huck treats at them, cause that always works. Twinkies, Hostess Cakes, anything, you name it. Funny enough, in Spider-Verse issue one, the cakes are referred to as Golden Sponge Cakes so that they don't get sued. It's also the same issue where we see the end of Golden Sponge Cake Spidey. It's sad, but if you stuck around for too long, realistically, everybody would just get fat or riddled with cavities. Spider Sense tells me this cake isn't for eating. It's for throwing! Number three, Superior Spider. Starting in 2013, this version is the outcome of the Dying Wish storyline when Dr. Octavius planted his mind inside Peter Parker's. Nice little swap. There we go. We see this begin in Amazing Spider-Man issue 698. Peter gets a priority call from the Avengers and when he meets them all on the raft, Cap informs him that one of his old enemies is dying and Peter knows that it's Doc Ock before he even tells him. Cap says that he's asking for him. Well, rather, he's asking for Peter Parker. Peter goes in and he asks everybody for a private moment, just the two of them to talk it out, right? But when they're in there, for that hot second, it's revealed that they somehow have switched bodies, page 20 and 22. So Peter in Doc's body is freaking out. He's worried what the hell to do, because now he's got his powers and his families and his friends are all at risk. You gotta stay away from those brain-swapping octobots. That's the key. I'm not gonna tell you what happens because it's really enjoyable. Go check it out yourself. Number two, Spider Boy. Marvel and DC are powerhouses, both on page and on screen. So when the two companies combine forces, we get some pretty amazing characters like Spider Boy. Making his first debut in Marvel vs. DC issue three, residing on Earth 9602, Spider Boy is an amalgam of Spider Man and Superboy. How epic is that? Spider Boy is a clone. Now he's a clone of Peter who was created during an accidental lab explosion. General Ross felt responsible for this explosion, so he ended up adopting the young lab lad. 
They were a fun duo until Ross was taken out by a mugger. So Pete then became a hero. He put together the suit, became famous almost overnight. That whole event kicked off the with great power comes great responsibility vibe. Now back when he returned to Project Cadmus, Pete was given a web pistol to help him swing around town. In this story, he doesn't have webs here, but it doesn't really matter. Because of his new superpowers, he can focus gravity inwards to make himself stronger and move faster, or he can lower gravity around himself in order to jump higher, further, and faster. He just clicks the off switch on gravity and then climbs walls. Must be nice. Guy probably kills it with wall sets. And finally, number one, Flash, Betty, and John. For the last one on this list, we figured we'd end on a three in one. What If is releasing weekly episodes on Disney Plus currently, so I have to throw it back to one of my favorite issues from volume one back in the 70s. What if someone else besides Spider-Man had been bitten by the radioactive spider? Written by Don Glutt, What If volume one, issue seven, we get to see Flash Thompson, Betty Brandt, and John Jameson get their shot at being Spider-Man. How lucky. First, Flash gets bit, he gets the powers, and he teaches a bad driver a lesson. With his new strength, I mean, he's a little bit too harsh. The middle finger always works, but okay, rocky start, that's fine. Then he decides to take a crack at professional wrestling. He thinks it's gonna be a breeze, but due to said super strength, he killed the guy instead of tapping him out. Not much of a superhero there. The Vulture ends up ending his not so hot streak, so next up we have Betty Brandt. Her costume is arguably the flashiest. It makes for great photo shoots, apparently. Gotta get those likes somehow, make those super powered TikToks. I'm here for it. But when she runs out of web fluid while striking a pose, the thief that takes Uncle Ben's life runs on by, and no one does anything about it. And finally, this issue shows us John Jameson getting his shot. While his outfit was also pretty on point, his judgment was not. John tried to stop a space shuttle from crashing and didn't live to tell the tale. Next time you feel like web swinging to work, just remember that the responsibility thing is just as important as the powers. Kicking off the list at number 10, Grey Hulk. One of the more badass versions of the Hulk was also the earliest. See, originally Stan Lee wanted the Hulk to be gray, but ink problems made him green. The Incredible Hulk made his first smashing appearance in 1962 when a teenager, Rick Jones, was about to be caught up in a gamma bomb test. Scientist Bruce Banner ran out and threw him to safety. But in doing so, he himself was caught in said explosion and in turn, he was irradiated with radioactive particles, becoming the Grey Hulk. Our green guy, the main 616 Hulk, is referred to as the Savage Hulk, and Grey Hulk is said to be weaker. They made him an entirely different version in the comics to help explain the color change. They were both fighting to control Bruce. Things get spicy during Peter David's run when we meet Joe Fixit, this mobster Grey Hulk working at a casino. Imagine this guy asking you for your ID. I would bring five pieces and a passport, just to be safe. So intimidating. And his hat too, like he looks friendly, but he also looks like when he shakes your hand, he's gonna break all your knuckles. Number nine, Skulk. Coming to life in Doctor Strange Fate issue one back in 1996, Marvel's Bruce Banner combined with DC's Solomon Grundy. How fun. Another gray version, but a little more out there this time around. Solomon appeared right before Bruce Banner was caught in that gamma bomb explosion. So now the two ended up using together, creating Skulk. Skulk was taught by Doctor Strange Fate that in order to remain in human form, you need the assistance of magic. Black Widow's palm dances will not work in this universe, my friend. So Banner was like, all right, I'll work for you. Just make sure I don't become that awful pale monster. Deal? Deal. Great, awesome. Skulk's last comic was in Lobo the Duck issue one just a year later. He died in the destruction caused by the gold kidney lady. Yes, you heard me correctly. And before we list off some other fun versions of the Hulk, if you wanna skulk smash that like button, that would be lovely. Those clicks really do help us out a lot here. You all rock, now let's keep this list going. Number eight, Peter Parker. Looking now to the 2006 bullet point storyline, if you haven't already guessed from the title, this one's a superhero swap. We love those. Now this is a life where Uncle Ben, well, still died, but he died a lot earlier. So unfortunately he wasn't around to mentor Peter. Give him the whole with great power comes great responsibility rundown. So now Peter's stealing Jeeps. He's blasting Green Day and flipping off the elderly. Just the complete opposite guy that we know and love. During the Jeep joyride, it ran out of gas. So Sneaky Pete went off to look for some more to help fill up. Now while he was searching, that's when he just happened to stumble across that gamma bomb test. And he didn't realize that he had this Hulk side to him until later on that night. His friends got in trouble so they blamed Peter and that's when he got really angry and then he turned into the Hulk for the first time. It was nuts. Aunt May straight up had a heart attack. 
more than fair. After this point, retired Steve Rogers came back, suited up as Iron Man, and then began hunting him down. This universe is crazy. Peter Hulk killed Steve Rogers, and he didn't go down until Galactus arrived on Earth. Not a bad run. Number seven, Ultimate Hulk. This version of Bruce is quite troubled. He was taught to just stay out of his parents' way growing up, and he also hated himself, pretty much. He wanted to be ripped like Captain America, he didn't like his noodle arms, it was a rough go for him in the Ultimate Universe. So when Nick Fury got together the brightest minds to recreate the Super Soldier Serum, Envious Banner was on that team. He did figure it out, I mean, or so he thought, but he kept the info to himself, he didn't want any other scientist getting credit. But he took it a little bit too far when he also decided to keep the human testing process to himself as well. He injected himself and became became Ultimate Hulk. The first time he changed, he injured Mary and Richard Parker, but down the road, he injected himself again, but this time he mixed Super Soldier Serum with Hulk Serum, and then he turned to gray, and his first plan of attack was, of course, as you would think, to fight Freddie Prince Jr. Yeah. Number six, Infernal Hulk. First appearing in Deadpool Annual 1, this version picks up after Bruce Banner became the Sorcerer Supreme. And his first trick was to separate the Hulk from himself and just banish him as far away as possible. And what better place to throw him than the pits of hell? While in the land down down under, Hulk became Infernal Hulk. A little more scary looking than Joe Fix It, just, just a little bit. So when our 616 banner arrived to this universe with Spider-Man, Infernal Hulk traded places in hell with the other Bruce's Hulk persona. So now that Infernal Hulk is free and he's going back after Banner, he's pissed. So Deadpool, Spidey, and Supreme Banner, they all figured, okay, let's just reverse this banishing spell and then as soon as Banner shows back up, we break his neck. All right, go team, let's do it. Number five. Hulk 2099. John Eisenhart this time around made his first appearance in 2099 Unlimited Issue 1 back in 1993. This is the future, of course, one of many alternate Marvel futures where heroes are simply no more. But fear not as we still have cults. Thank God, you gotta have those cults. One cult called the Knights of Banner was piquing the interest of Eisenhart, but at this point, he was this LA movie studio guy and he wanted to make a movie about these knights or this Hulk cult or whatever. They're pretty much us in the future. They worship the Hulk, they have meetings, they talk about him, they probably create top 10 lists, I don't know. But when they turned down the money and said beat it, Eisenhart wasn't happy. So he tricked one of the young members, Gawain, into spilling the beans about the cult and how they're performing illegal gamma experiments. Gawain is actually a reference to Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, an Arthurian story that combined the beheading game and the exchange of winnings. And that's exactly what happened here. John reported this cult and its new secrets and the police raided and killed everybody all but Gawain. So John tried to fix what he'd caused, but it was far too late. After a gamma bomb went off, he was turned into the 2099 Hulk. Consumed now with guilt as well, he vowed to protect the young knight, and when Draco killed Gawain, spoilers, he figured he would just defend the people from future threats. Number four, Compound Hulk. First appearing in Hulk Volume 2, Issue 30, Clue is a smarter version of that Grey Hulk that I mentioned earlier in this list. He's an advanced clone, rather, created by Zemnu. Now, Clue was the result of a clone Cloning gone wrong, classic. And then when Clue and Zemnu were fighting Red Hulk, Impossible Man came in, he was watching the whole thing, and he used his powers to merge both of those guys into the compound Clue. He didn't last long at all, but anytime the words merge and Hulk are in play, eh, it's bound to get weird. Number three, Venom Hulk. Venom Hulk is as terrifying as you think. It all goes down in What If Issue 4. It shows us what would happen if the alien costume had possessed Spider-Man. So if the Fantastic Four hadn't have been able to separate Peter and the suit initially. It's a, you know, it's a fun little alternative. It gets pretty ugly quickly and the other Avengers are called upon to try and stop Peter from causing more irreversible damage. Doctor Strange is hurling spells at him for hours. Still, it's no use. And you'd think when the Hulk came along, he could just, you know, huck Peter into a few walls until he calms down. But he arrives and the symbiote sees his power and he's like, mm, that looks pretty good. I want that. Give me. And then when it comes into contact with the Hulk, this nightmare is born. When Thor comes in to hopefully try and end this disaster of a situation, he too is consumed by the symbiote. I really hope we get to see some sort of evil version of the Hulk in this What If Disney show. I mean, Venom Hulk would be amazing. I would love to see this issue on TV. Might be a little long shot, but maybe Grey Hulk, perhaps. I don't know. Some sort of evil Hulk is coming. I feel it. Number two, Lizard Hulk. Still green this time around, just a little more wet and scaly. He comes from Earth 19919. Robert Banner, of course, has a similar origin as the Hulk that we're now familiar with, only he was infected by the spider virus in Spider Island issue one. So a little more mm, this time around. Now he's got extra arms and he's even more powerful. 
just what you want. The Spider Queen at this point is standing tall over Manhattan with the residents of New York City turning into spiders, which I gotta say, worst thing I've ever heard. I feel itchy just reading that. And as for our heroes, it's probably best if they switch to a different animal's DNA to avoid the whole mind control Spider Queen awful situation. So Captain America gets a hairy upgrade and the Hulk gets paired with some lizard DNA, resulting in a weird but exciting storyline. Major Godzilla vibes over here. And finally, number one, you guessed it, Old Man Logan. Remember that time that the Hulk was a landlord and had Hulklings with his cousin Jen Walters? Mmm, let's talk about it. Old Man Logan is an absolute masterpiece, first of all. Created by Mark Miller and Steve McNiven, we get to see a dark future where supervillains have taken over the United States. Bruce Banner ended up taking over California from Abomination and appropriately named it Hulk Land. An atomic bomb over California changed Bruce up, he charged him, and now he wasn't this quirky scientist that you know and love. Now he's kind of a dick. Hulk Gang is also a treat. We have in total Bobby Joe, Charlie, Otis, Rufus, Bo, Elrod, Eustace, and of course, Woody. Good old Woody Banner, what a gem. They come knocking on your door when you don't pay rent. Yeah, and you thought your landlord sucked, think again. They're honestly evil, like they're literally evil. They killed Logan's family because they felt like it. They were bored. They whip around in style with the fantastic car, and then when Logan returned from his road trip with Hawkeye, well, he was a little upset to say the least. The only survivor once Logan was done with them was Billy Bob Banner. Coming in number 10, we've got Thor L. On the surface, this is a pretty cool looking superhero. Nothing too outrageous to see here. No funky animal parts, no silly gag weapons, no ridiculous shoehorning into a larger plot that may or may not make sense. Well, that last one is contestable, but we'll ignore it for now. The thing about Thor L is that he's a fusion of two famous heroes, one of which is Thor. Can you guess who number two is in this combination? Well, if you thought we were strictly sticking to Marvel today, you'd be wrong. Thor L is the result of Marvel and DC's crossover comics known as Amalgam Comics. Crossovers are done all the time, they're part of the wicked fun that is comic books, but to have these two Goliath comic creators cross over, well, that was something wild. Superman or Kal El plus Thor, what a duo! In this enormous universe connecting event, many new heroes were born. Thor-El wasn't the only crossover character created, but this is definitely new ground for both these supers involved. He's very blue this time around, thanks to the Superman here being Blue Energy Superman, and has a big ass T on his chest thanks to Thor, a very powerful creature indeed. Not a very long lived one though, as he only shows up a few times across a couple issues. Coming at number 9 we've got Iron Hammer. Sticking with the theme of crossovers, let's take a look at one that can be associated with the most ambitious crossover event of all time. The Avengers might seem a little basic at this point, what with them being the focal point of a multi-billion dollar film franchise that now largely controls the feature film industry, but they used to be something people got really excited for. You could hint at it unendingly and build up the hype as much as you wanted because people really wanted to see Iron Man, Thor, Captain America, Hawkeye, Black Widow, and the Hulk team up. Eventually they got Spider-Man in there too, phenomenal. A blast and a half, absolutely. But what happens when you quite literally cross some famous characters over? Well, you get Iron Hammer, which, very cool name by the way. He comes from the world of Infinity Warps, where Gamora messes up the universe, causing all sorts of heroes and villains to mishmash together. This results in a whole new squad of crazy characters, including Stark Odinson, the lovely sum of Iron Man and Thor. If you thought these two were strong on their own, just check this out. When Iron Hammer was first conceived, he sort of just lived his life as a human with no memory of anything else. Eventually he did realize his skill with technology and even further down the line discovered his Asgardian ancestry. The results? Iron Man with Asgardian enhanced technology. Magic and machine, together at last. Coming in number 8 we've got Zombie Thor. Ah, Marvel zombies, what a wild ride for all involved. One would assume that a literal god might be able to resist the zombie virus and fight back, but here we are. I guess it's more of a super zombie virus after all. After a valiant fight to keep hope alive, Thor could fight no longer. The Deadite Legion were too much for him in both numbers and power, and so Thor succumbed to the virus. From there he rose up, looking for a nice snack to eat and began his life as a zombie. Frankly, zombie Thor doesn't look all that different from regular Thor, save for a much spookier face and a nice set of chompers that we tend to focus on a little more than usual. Oh, and Mjolnir is no longer his weapon. As a zombie, he stops being worried Worthy, which leaves him kind of feeling naked. Instead of remaining as a hammerless zombie, Thor decides to find a new one. And so he does, in the form of a bunch of scraps cobbled together from the rubble. 
improvised weapons, and zombies. A tale as old as time. Coming in number 7, we've got Revenger Thor. Revenger, not Avenger. And we're not talking about the Revengers from Thor Ragnarok. We'll talk about MCU stuff some other time. For now, we're diving straight into the Cancerverse, where Lovecraftian abominations rule and death has been done away with entirely. That is a weird, tough pill to swallow. Somehow, Lord Marvel has corrupted the Avengers here and made it so that they serve the many angled ones. These creatures resemble the great old ones of Lovecraftian lore and really lean into that cosmic horror angle. Very spooky, very creepy, very mind boggling. Thor specifically gets a wild makeover, now sporting some weird tentacle protrusions out of his face and glowing red eyes to boot. Definitely not a hero that would bring relief to the face of a scared public. Coming at number 6 we've got Beta Ray Bill. This one is pretty much accidental in how it happened. A super soldier from a race known as Corbinites, Beta Ray Bill was already pretty powerful before being granted the power of Thor. When the Corbinites galaxy was destroyed, Bill was the one designated to protect their planet and he did so quite well. A very heroic hero, of course. So when he fought Thor over the use of Mjolnir, it turned out that he was indeed worthy of that power. In doing so, he was granted the power of Thor through a weapon called Stormbreaker. Good for you, Bill. I mean, Thor. I mean... Ah, whatever. Coming in at number 5, we've got Cyclops Thor. Mjolnir only has one eye, and now Thor does too. Sorry for that terrible joke, I just couldn't help it. Somewhere out there, there is a universe absolutely stuffed with Cyclops, beings only sporting one eye. Dead center on their heads, the look is an uncanny one indeed. In that very same world, all of the regular heroes we've come to know and love are around, although they're all sporting that singular optical nerve. Thor is included in this mess, and they eventually make it through some dimensional cracks to cause trouble in other realities. Powerful and weird to look at, this version of Thor is a doozy. Very strange indeed. Coming in number 4, we've got Venom Thor. The symbiote never gives up. No way, no how. In a universe where it does not attach itself to Eddie Brock, it does its best to find another suitable host. In the case of Venom, Thor, it first found Spider-Man. Featured in a What If comic, this time the symbiote hijacks Peter Parker. This causes all sorts of chaos, eventually resulting in it hopping to the Hulk. And then the jolly green giant eventually delivers it to Thor. This is particularly rough because this version of the alien creature doesn't recoil at the introduction of sonic energy. It just feeds off the energy of the heroes it attaches to. So for a while, Venom is born with the body and powers of an Asgardian. Yikes. Eventually, Thor is able to shake it off and defeat it. But that doesn't make up for the very strange image of a venom-colored god of thunder, though. Coming in at number 3, we've got Throg. It's Thor, but he's a frog. Just look at him. Man, what a world we live in where stuff like this is just readily accessible at all times. The god of thunder in adorable amphibian form. This version of Thor pops up a couple times, once being held captive in a jar and once in a run where all the Avengers were animals. The jar frog found in the void was hinted at being a result of one of Loki's pranks on Thor. Very funny brother, now turn me back into an Asgardian. The other throg is a wild tale of Simon Walterson accidentally getting turned into a frog, joining an animal war, coming across a piece of Mjolnir and transforming into Thor. Throg! It's Thor, but a frog. Coming in at number 2 we've got Thur. Even less sensical to say and even more goofy, this is an outlandishly cartoonish iteration of the God of Thunder. His story stays the same, his powers remain unchanged, but now Thor is a cartoon bulldog. He's part of the Scavengers. Scavengers? And was born in Arfgard. Oh me oh my. It's definitely mostly a gag character, originally appearing in an issue of the spectacular Spider Ham alongside Peter Porker, but Thur has been around and continues to show up. And at number one, we've got Thorangatan. Honestly, I just wanted to say this one out loud. Like, Throg and Thur are all fun and all, but the pun action on Thorangatan is unmatched. Say it out loud while looking at this goofy little monkey and tell me you don't crack a smile. Thorangatan is a hero on an Earth ruled by intelligent apes. Ape Avengers, Ape Symbol. And with that, I'll stop. Kicking off the list at number 10, Dark Claw. Coming from the Amalgam Universe, where DC and Marvel combine powers figuratively and literally, we get a Wolverine Batman double whammy. First appearing in Legends of the Dark Claw issue 1 back in 1996, at just age 5, young Logan Wayne witnessed the death of his parents, so now we have that Batman origin right off the bat to lay the foundation. Good stuff, always promising. And then Logan Wayne was sent to live with his uncle in Canada. But after poachers ambushed his home, we have even more family members biting the bullet. 
So far, so sad. Okay, so Logan Wayne enlisted then in the Royal Canadian Air Force and soon after the Weapon X program. This is all starting to sound a bit familiar, I bet. That's when the Wolverine origin comes in. Logan Wayne got the adamantium treatment, but it was a failure. In a way, kind of. Because Logan wasn't this mindless brute like he was in the comics. See, now he kept his sanity. So now we're starting to get more of a positive vibe, which is good for a good start of this list. Afterwards, he was a free man. So he studied criminology, forensics, gymnastics, martial arts, anything he could get his hands on, including the 127 major styles of combat. That mixed with the claws, Logan Wayne is somebody I'd never want to cross paths with, either as Batman or just Wolverine. Either way, I'm like, no, you guys are both gonna kill me. And before we continue on with this list, if you wanna go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, support our man Wolverine, he is Canadian, we are Canadian, only makes sense, really hit those thumbs up, you guys are the best, let's get back to the list. Number nine, Wild Thing. For this one, we go over to the MC2 universe where Elektra married Wolverine and soon after came a child, of course. That daughter was named Rena Logan, and if that name doesn't ring a bell, she's also called Wild Thing. Marvel's MC2 imprint quickly gained momentum after What If, issue 105, which introduced us to a universe full of other super kids. Wild Thing's powers are very similar to her father's, obviously. I mean, even just by looking at her, you could probably make a guess who she's an offspring of. All that aggression, you're like, okay, it's definitely Wolverine. She also possesses the power of regenerative healing and super strength, but what makes her stand out really is the psychic claws. Instead of adamantium claws, she has minor psionic abilities that allow her to manifest her own claws, but if she focuses hard enough, if she really thinks, she can have claws, real life claws, like her father, and dish out physical damage too. Mental, physical, she's got you beat in both realms. Number eight, Hydra Wolverine. Hearing Cap say Hail Hydra in Endgame was a wild moment to witness in theaters. Steve using future knowledge to save the day instead of kicking everybody's ass in the elevator, whilst tipping his hat to comic book fans, it was a nice moment, beautifully written in. In Exiles issue 92, we get to see Logan turn sides briefly as well. In this reality, Wolverine is a Hydra agent and the Invisible Woman is Madam Hydra. And to make things even more strange, they're both lovers. Yeah, this, this odd couple here alongside Slaymaster left their reality after fighting the Exiles and they tried to conquer the multiverse. Hydra Wolvie wasn't around too long for he was actually brutally taken out by the cat with his own claws in New Exiles issue 12. Number seven. Captain Logan. Coming from the noir series, Earth 90214, Jim Logan was a detective, much like our 616 Logan, his past was also troubled. His partner was his half-brother named Dog Logan, who has the brains of a bedbug and the manners of a gutter rat. And that's in his words, not mine. His origins are a little bit messy when it comes to the noir verse, because in X-Men Noir, Mark of Cain, Wolverine's origins are that of a bootlegger whose past is never really touched on. All we know is that he's a former lover of Jean Grey and that he was the one who took out Scott Summers' left eye. But here in Wolverine Noir, he's a detective with a gritty Catholic past. Either way, the noir versions of Wolverine is quite dark, and although his claws aren't built in this time around, he still has them as a weapon of choice. Real Freddy Krueger style, I like it. Number six, Weapon X. One of the more extreme versions of Wolverine, Weapon X came from the Age of Apocalypse storyline, and the first time we meet him is in X-Men Alpha issue one. Weapon X was a member of the X-Men, only this time around Magneto is running the team. How lovely is that? He's great. One of the most notable differences between this Logan and others is that Weapon X is missing a hand. He had battled Cyclops, and although he lost it in the fight, Logan can still use claws on that arm. Now in this reality, Wolverine, sorry, Weapon X, was married to Jean Grey. So a little light in this warped reality. Love still exists out there, it's true. He later on became Weapon Omega, AKA the hair to apocalypse. So it's really not that great. There's love, but there's also evil stuff. Number five, Zombie Wolverine. We're just a day out from another episode of What If on Disney Plus and we're all so excited and I'll be honest, a little bit nervous because those zombie Avengers are still super powered and they're still on the way. Zombie Wolverine first appeared in Ultimate Fantastic Four issue 22. Now at the Xavier Institute, Wolverine and the X-Men were taken on a zombified Alpha Flight when Magneto came in to save the day. He was part of the crew that went to fight off the remaining horde, but I did introduce him as Zombie Wolverine, so yes, he was sadly infected. Wolverine was bitten by Zombie Hawkeye and Zombie Cap, and after he turned into one himself, he defeated and then ate the Silver Surfer. An afternoon snack quickly gave Wolverine cosmic powers, quite the upgrade. It's a gory good time. If we had X-Men in the MCU right now, the zombie episodes would have been so much better, but we can't complain, it's still good stuff. Wolverine is a main character in the Marvel Zombies Dead Days and a minor antagonist in Marvel Zombies vs. Army of Darkness. If you haven't read either, I recommend you read both of them. Read all the zombie comics. I shouldn't have to sell you on how cool zombie superhero comics are. You know, number four, 
Mr. Murder Hands. There's a nickname, a rather fitting one, really. Logan from Earth 65 first appeared in Spider Gwen Volume 2, Issue 20. He was a former Japanese samurai who was cursed by a witch. The curse was that you have to live on Earth for all the days that his targets, the people that he killed, would have. So he's going to see quite a few days, basically. His memory here is also erased, and it happens right after he joins the Weapon X program, where he's also given his trademark adamantium claws. When he later joins S.H.I.E.L.D.'s Black Ops team, his fellow operatives give him the nickname of Mr. Murder Hands. Nice. Oh, this is your teammate, Edward Murder Hands. Yeah, make sure you sign in. Great. Break a like, team. Number three, Primal Wolverine. A side we don't get to see too often is Logan's animalistic side. Although maybe it's for the best, we don't want to see that. We don't want any of that smoke, really. Coming from the Mutant Next series back in 1998, we pick up with Wolverine, Sabretooth, and Wild Child, but this time around they're referred to as the Pack. Now in this story, Logan still goes crazy after Weapon X does their thing, but this time he's not alone. Sabretooth and Wild Child also endure these crazy experiments, each of them also going primal in the end. Now the three of them end up roaming the Canadian wilderness like an actual pack. But this pack is one you want to avoid. They end up going nuts by the end of the comic, like I said, but while they're in the wild, they did see other mutants and in turn they all work together for a hot moment to figure out what was happening in Weapon X. They have the right idea, but those animalistic impulses are just too powerful. Messy. Number two, Old Man Logan. Mark Miller's Old Man Logan begins in volume three of Wolverine on issue 66, and this is a future where supervillains have sadly one for the most part. Hulk and She-Hulk had kids, the Hulklings, who would beat the crap out of you if you didn't pay rent. So yeah, it's an odd future to say the least. Everybody has their own territory, so Logan now has to pay up for living in his. Hawkeye, who was much older and this time around he was blind, needed Logan's assistance to get across the country and deliver a secret package. This was a way Logan could get some of that rent money, so let's do it. Just talking about Logan paying rent money is a weird thing. When they get back from their trip, things have changed drastically. Now Hulk gang actually took out Logan's family because, you know, they were bored. And that's what people do when they're bored in this dark future. No more games, no more talking. Now it's time for Logan just to get payback. Simple as that. Alternate reality, same temper. Logan gets Banner, he gets him right through the chest, so naturally he hulks out. And then when Hulk eats Logan, you think that would for sure be the end of it, but that's when Logan pops out from inside Banner. Surprise, we're gonna throw up. And finally, number one. Old Man Venom. Coming from Edge of Venomverse issue 4, we see Logan get captured by Angel, who is Archangel in disguise, and Hulk Jr. This story played out differently than the Old Man Logan storyline because this Wolverine told Bruce Banner Jr. what happened to his father. Archangel took Logan to the danger room of the X-Mansion and that's where he and Bruce Jr. just ambushed him. Wasn't very happy this time around, although the first one wasn't really happy in any way, I guess, either. Bruce Jr. had this idea that maybe if he kills Logan, he can then use his DNA and create symbiote hybrid clones, but what ended up happening was Logan fought a Venomsaurus Rex, that same T-Rex from the original Old Man Logan storyline. The same one we see chasing Hawkeye and Logan. So he fought it, got eaten by it, and then considering the fact that Logan was eaten by the Hulk and ripped his way out, we already know that this is going to be much better. He comes out better than ever. The symbiote ends up bonding with Logan in the T-Rex tummy, giving us a pretty exciting extreme upgrade. He rips his way through the dinosaur and subsequently rips his way through his enemies.